couple years ago, I put out an episode on the topic of prepping. Reason being is when you have a homestead and try to live self-sufficiently, it's often brought to your attention just how much crossover there is between the two camps, that is between homesteaders and preppers, as those categories are generally defined. The name of the episode was When Prepping is Biblical and When It's Not, if you want to go back and listen to that. The main argument I tried to make in that one was how the stereotypical practice of prepping, uh, which I think I defined as the stockpiling of whatever supplies you think you'll need to survive whatever large-scale disaster scenario you imagine could happen in your lifetime, um, isn't necessarily a biblical calling on the Christian life. Particularly as it relates to thoughts of apocalypse and doomsday, a Christian's preparations are actually meant to look much more heavenward. Granted, I acknowledge there are examples of biblical figures who, in acts of obedience, did prepare for certain life-altering events, and there are also plenty of biblical instructions and implied principles for the believer to adopt a mindset of common sense, everyday preparations for both foreseeable needs and sudden emergencies. However, even in all of that, I argued that the reason we're told as believers to plan ahead for any realistic future scenario isn't to be selfish. It it isn't to focus on the tangible, and it isn't to have an objective of mere survival, but it's ultimately to serve others, to focus on what's ultimately eternal, and to be busy about what is our ultimate purpose for being on this earth, whether that purpose, whether that commission results in our living another 50 years or dying tomorrow for the cause of Christ. Again, you can go back and listen to that episode if you'd like. The name of it was When Prepping is Biblical and When It's Not. In this episode, though, I thought I'd chime in again on the topic, and the reason for that is because out of all of the episodes Amy and I have put out there, that prepping episode has received some of the most attention and views out of any of them, so evidently it's something people are curious about, and I thought might warrant just a little more discussion. Another reason is because of all of the obvious craziness we see happening in the world today, from Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine, including Vladimir Putin's prior threats to use tactical nuclear weapons should he feel a justifiable reason to do so, or the concern he could spark a mutually destructive cyber war against the West and bring down critical pieces of infrastructure. Or in more recent headlines, there's the news that Iran is now capable of producing its own nuclear arsenal, and there's the memory of the Iranian president expressing his belief that Israel is a cancerous tumor that should be wiped off the map, if you remember that. Uh, There's also recent statements by Iran's media that Iranian ballistic missiles have the capability of, quote, turning New York into a hellish ruin, end quote. All that comes only a couple weeks after New York City's emergency management department released a public service announcement video explaining to residents what they should do in the event of an actual nuclear attack. (laughs) That, That video, of course, left a lot of people a bit unnerved. There's also concerns about China, and if it's going to make a move on Taiwan, there's still the concern of North Korea and its intentions towards South Korea, etc., etc. Suffice it to say, the world continues to be a crazy place to live. Well, in, in light of all that, I wanted to share some material I stumbled across from Pastor John Piper, who many of you have heard of and, and who I personally have a lot of respect for. Uh, Piper is perhaps best known for his emphasis on the glory of God as the chief end for mankind's existence and for the mankind's purpose and privilege to enjoy God above all competing desires and interests. And yes, that includes even above the American dream, uh, e- even above life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The idea is that we exist for a significantly greater objective than 80 years of self-preservation and prosperity. We exist to see and savor the glory of Christ for ages upon ages in a more permanent home than the one we currently occupy. If you want to hear more on that theme, Piper has written a lot of books and has preached a lot of sermons, all available online. You can visit DesiringGod.com to see those archives. Another outlet Piper uses to spread his messages through his podcast called Ask Pastor John, where he deals with any number of practical or theological questions posed to him. At the time I'm recording this, he has something like 1,800 different episodes already recorded. But for you preppers out there, or those prospective preppers out there, there are two episodes in particular that Piper has put out that may interest you. The first is in an episode titled, Am I Wrong to Prepare for a Nuclear Doomsday? And the other is called, Isn't it Loving to My Family to Prepare for Doomsday? 
I thought I'd pull excerpts from those two episodes and share them with you. In his episode titled, Am I Wrong to Prepare for a Nuclear Doomsday, recorded at the time in a, in a context of increasing concern over the threat of North Korea's nuclear saber rattling, one questioner writes in to ask Piper, quote, North Korea has been in the news a lot lately. With threats of a nuclear attack, Christians around me are starting to fear. I know so many Christians who talk of stocking food, water, and supplies, even a few considering buying and installing an underground bomb shelter in the event of such an attack. When it comes to this new Cold War era, at least new to a lot of us, how should Christians plan wisely? End quote. By, by the way, I understand the question primarily deals with a nuclear attack, though it can be said that the same level of concern could apply to any number of catastrophic events. Cyber attacks, EMPs, uh, a second uh, American Civil War, World War III, pandemics, you name it, there's plenty to strike fear. In answering the question, Piper starts off acknowledging that, in all honesty, there seems to always be the concern of some life-disturbing event, not all of which ever even happen. He talks about the big hysteria that was once Y2K and how everybody then was worried there would be a global computer crash when the clock turned over to the 2000s and how during that widespread paranoia, a lot of people, including a lot of Christians, uh, sought to stockpile provisions in the event of a complete systems crash on the pretense they'd be in a better position to serve those around them who hadn't taken the needed steps. And while ministry motives were their claim, the perception of these early preppers by a lot of observers was anything but selfless and benevolent, but, but their behavior smacked of fear instead of faith and self-preservation over selfless service. In terms of Piper's thinking on preparing for a nuclear scenario, he mentions five reasons why he doesn't buy into the urgency shared by so many in the prepper community. The first reason he gives is a conviction that danger and risk are normal for the Christian life, not exceptional. Danger and risk are the norm, not the exception. He mentions how the dominant New Testament approach to living is not self-protection, but self-sacrifice. For example, in 2 Corinthians, Paul describes his own life like this, quote, countless beatings, I'm often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, end quote. In Luke chapter 21, verses 16 through 19, Jesus warned, Such is the life the Christian can expect. Quote, You will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. End quote. In other words, biblically, Christians are told to prepare to endure hardship more than they're told to escape hardship. That's not to say escaping hardship is always wrong. Uh, to be fair, Jesus also told his disciples in the very same chapter that when Jerusalem would later fall, they should be prepared to, quote, flee to the mountains, right? Those inside the city being encouraged to uh, bug out, <laughs> to, to depart, and those out in the country being cautioned not to enter. So, uh, yes, there, there's got to be a balance. But the overarching expectation is, though precautions can be taken, don't anticipate a total escape. Persecutions and hardships will catch up to you. And that's okay. Why? Because it's part of God's plan. The second reason he gives to why he doesn't buy into the whole prepper mindset is because any major efforts at self-preservation is inevitably going to obscure to the world the basic message of Jesus. And what is the basic message of Jesus? Well, Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25 says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The whole point of the gospel speaks to a hope not found in this whole sinful world or in one's efforts to delay the inevitability of our bodies returning to dust, but... Our hope is found in a better world to come and the pursuit to see the old man lay down his life with Christ in order to see a new man raised with him 
anticipating a life far better than the one the rest of the world so desperately tries to cling on to. The third reason Piper gives is that if you are known as a person who devotes a lot of money and effort and focus on creating an earthly refuge, it's going to make the Psalms sound really hollow in your mouth. Listen to these verses, Psalm 31, verses 3 and 4. You are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Psalm 61, verse 3, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Psalm 62, verses 7 and 8, on God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Or Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Such are the songs sung not by Christians safely fortified from any danger, but by servants vulnerable to the world's dangers, yet fully trusting in the Lord's sovereign plan. They're songs sung by the likes of missionaries willing to lay down their lives to share the gospel and hostile tribes that are expected to kill them by the spear upon their arrival. That, of course, is a reference to men like Jim Elliott and the four others who were martyred by the savage Wa'adani tribe in Ecuador. Men all speared to death for trying to share Christ. And while you might think that's such a waste of a good life, consider what Elliot himself said prior to setting out on that fatal missionary trip. He said, quote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Or as Jesus put it, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? Or he might substitute, to gain his life and yet to forfeit his soul. So, God is our ultimate refuge, and and if that's not true for you, the Psalms won't make any sense. Fourthly, in response to those who think there's only one right answer to the question, uh, Piper notes it is allowed in Scripture when danger comes to either flee or to stand and suffer. What to do when the peanut butter finally hits the fan doesn't have to be identical for every Christian. Uh, I've made the point in other episodes when Horrific persecution broke out in Rome under Nero in the first century. There were some Christians who indeed fled, and and there were other Christians who decided to stay put. Sure, many of those Christians ended up dying for their faith and were thrown in the Colosseum or were used as human torches for Nero's gardens, but folks, believe it or not, some of those Christians who endured such persecution stayed voluntarily and knew exactly what they were signing up for. You ask, where's the sanity and all of that? Well, it's found, as Paul explains in Philippians 1, in the witness that to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is opportunity for future ministry, while to die is to depart and be with Christ and and to convey to the world that he is Lord and we are not going to bow to anyone else, especially not some insane dictator wielding the tyrant's sword. Cut off our heads if you want, but here we stand, we can do no other. With all that said, while some may choose to stand firm, others may choose to get out of Dodge to protect their families and preserve the church. That's not necessarily wrong either. John Bunyan, who spent 12 years in prison himself for standing his ground, uh, wrote to defend both possible paths of obedience as biblical, both to flee or to take a stand. In a publication he wrote titled Seasonable Counsel or Advice to Sufferers in the 1600s, Bunyan at one point wrote, quote, Having regard to what was said afore about a call to suffer, thou mayest do in this even as it is in thy heart. If it is in thy heart to fly, fly. If it be in thy heart to stand, stand. Anything but a denial of the truth. He that flies has warrant to do so. He that stands has warrant to do so. Yea, the same man may both fly and stand, as the call and working of God with his heart may be. Moses fled, and Moses stood. David fled, and David stood. Jeremiah fled, and Jeremiah stood. Christ withdrew himself. Christ stood. Paul fled, and Paul stood. 
end quote. So, b- biblically, a believer can end up doing both, depending on how God leads him at the time. Finally, Piper says the fifth reason he hesitates to jump on the prepper bandwagon is because it might misrepresent the value of Christ and heaven and give the impression that death is the worst thing that could happen to a person. In other words, if our chief concern and if all our efforts are placed in preserving this life above all other pursuits, what are we saying about this life? What are we saying or what are we failing to say about what comes after this life? Friends, whether we realize it or not, the impression we're giving is that this world is all there is. And if we run out of food, or if the power grid goes down, or if Russia or Iran or China or North Korea detonates the bomb, then the game is over. It's the end. But folks, it's not the end. It's just the end of the preface before the real saga of eternity begins. Don't buy into the lie that these brief 80 years of life, or, or however long you're blessed to live, is all there is and therefore is where we should be placing all our investment, because that is simply not the case. Well, those are five reasons John Piper gives for why he doesn't share the same level of urgency a lot of people share when uh, reading the latest headlines. Uh, But then in another episode he gave titled, Isn't it loving to my family to prepare for doomsday? Another questioner writes in asking, quote, Dear Pastor John, hello. It seemed to me that your response in your episode on preparing for nuclear doomsday was all predicated on the assumption that anybody who prepares for a possible disaster does so out of self-preservation. As a father and husband, I have intentionally put myself in situations that caused extended periods of great personal discomfort and danger of injury and death for what I believed was the good of others. I say this not to puff myself up because I certainly have strains of cowardice within me, but to make the point that some degree of preparedness for possible disaster may be from a desire to protect the people I am charged by God with protecting. He goes on to to say, in your book, This Momentary Marriage, you say that it is a husband's duty to protect his wife, physically and spiritually. I have no great compulsion to preserve my own life because I can honestly say with Paul to live as Christ and to die as gain. But if ever I found myself in a situation where the people I love are suffering when I could have prevented it, I would feel like I have failed in my God-given responsibility to protect their physical well-being. Is this wrong? End quote. So here it seems Piper gets a little pushback or at least a request for some further clarification on what the Christian's responsibility is when faced with danger, if not for himself, then for the protection of his family. In answer to the question, does a Christian fail in their God-given responsibility if the people they love end up suffering when the suffering that they endure could have otherwise been prevented? Piper says the answer to that question is... Not necessarily. He says, quote, It is possible indeed that you have been careless in some way and have brought down suffering upon your family for no good reason except your own carelessness, selfishness, or foolishness. That is possible. Any thoughtlessness, carelessness, selfishness, and foolishness that result in people being hurt if our fault should be a matter repented from. But have I failed in my God-given responsibility if people I love are suffering when I could have prevented it if I am thoughtfully, prayerfully obeying God's call on my life in the pursuit of a greater good than the physical safety of my family? The, the answer to that is not at all. He goes on to say, quote, There is a difference between trying to beat a train to an intersection and taking your family to Pakistan to serve Jesus. The first is probably foolishness, and the second may be obedience. He then talks about how in in his own pastoral ministry he made the decision early in life and in a season when his own kids were relatively young to live in the second highest crime-ridden part of Minneapolis so he could be closer to his church. If asked, aren't you concerned about the safety of your kids and your wife? His answer was yes, but not so concerned as to keep us away. He explains, quote, if one of the dozens of gunshots that we heard over the years had come through the window and killed one of my kids, would I feel like I failed? No, I would not. That kind of thinking is deadly to Christian obedience and the completion of the Great Commission and the living of kingdom lives that show our citizenship is not in this world. Does Jesus fail when he sends his disciples out as sheep in the midst of wolves and some of them are killed? Has he failed? Could he have kept them safe? Well, of course he could, but that's not his top priority, and it should not be ours, end quote. 
Again, it goes back to the reason Christians are in this world to begin with. The, the purpose of our lives is more than just survival. We have a job to do, and yes, that job sometimes comes with risks. Should we be haphazard with our family's safety? Absolutely not. But are there more important things at stake than just our family's safety? That's something you've got to weigh in your own reflections on the Great Commission. So, to ask the question again, have I failed in my God-given responsibility if people I love are suffering when I could have prevented it? And the answer is, maybe so, but maybe not. Well, wherever you are in your own thoughts on the whole idea of prepping, I I hope you find John Piper's two podcasts helpful uh, in offering what I think is a balanced view. I'll put the links to to those two resources in the description so you can go back and and listen to those for yourself. Uh, And again, if you haven't listened to my episode titled When Prepping is Biblical and When It's Not, I'll add the link to that as well. The fact of the matter is, there's always the threat of calamity on the horizon. Uh, Some of that potential calamity may never even happen, while some of it may happen any moment. What is the Christian to do? Uh, Well, the Christian can certainly prepare as best as he or she sees fit to prepare, while still understanding and still being faithful to the greater realities we are called to. I know I've given you a lot. I'm going to end it there. Um, If we are to preserve this life, let us do so with the primary intention of serving the Lord, not simply to serve ourselves or even our families only. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, I want to encourage you to do that. Stay tuned for more episodes to come. Until next time, thanks for listening, and God bless. 